Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. My name is Bob Willis and I'll be presenting and organizing today's webinar. Before we start talking about uh, the subject of today, uh, I'd first like to introduce you to the control panel. But also I'd like to uh, make you aware this is a pre-show webinar. So it's a pre-show prior to Productronica where I'll be running the solder paste and solder joint inspection experience. A little bit about that later on. Now, you have access to the control panel on your PC or on your screen at this moment in time, and it allows you to do a number of things during the webinar. First of all, you can open and close the panel by clicking on the orange button. This prevents the panel obscuring your view of the slides during the webinar. Now, you can make the image on your screen or on your projection facility go full screen by clicking on the blue button. And if you have any questions during the webinar, you can type them directly into the control panel. Now, with regard to uh, recordings and also a copy of the presentation, um, this is the information you will receive on an email shortly after the end of the webinar. Uh, a copy of the presentation will be available as a download PDF and you'll also be able to listen to the recording of the presentation probably a couple of hours, three hours after the end of the webinar session, but possibly leave it till tomorrow morning to visit uh, the YouTube site for uh, the recording. And you can always pass it on to any colleagues if you would like to. Now, if you have any technical problems during uh, the session this afternoon, please use one of the telephone numbers provided on your login and registration emails. You'll also need your ID and access code, which was also included on your emails. It's not possible for the presenter or, in this particular case, the organizer myself to be able to assist you during a live presentation. During the uh, presentation this afternoon, we're going to have a couple of survey questions, and this information will also be provided to you uh, for your reference uh, shortly after uh, the end of the webinar uh, sessions. Um, there's also a survey question at the end of the webinar, and it gives you the opportunity to uh, provide some feedback on the content and also subjects you'd like to hear about in the future. Now, a little bit about uh, my background before we start. Uh, I've been involved in uh, engineering all of my working life as a mechanical engineer uh, or a process engineer, both involved in PCB fabrication and also PCB assembly. And over the last uh, 25 or so years, I've been running my own training and consultancy business worldwide, putting on features like we'll discuss at Productronica and other international shows. I generally refer to these as the experience, and we've had the experience on standard SMT, lead-free technology, package on package, conformal coating, cleaning, and more recently on uh, the inspection of solder paste and solder joints. Next year, uh, the event will be focusing on rework and repair of printed circuit board assemblies. Now, um, the experience uh, this year at Productronica uh, will focus on the automatic inspection of solder paste on printed circuit boards and it will also incorporate conductive adhesives and what we'll be doing is printing this particular board and we'll be measuring the solder paste or conductive adhesive deposits on the surface of the printed circuit board and measuring the volume and uh, height it will incorporate a number of uh, package types depending on the type of material we're actually using the second part of the experience, uh, we'll be looking at solder joints. And this board, which uh, was provided by MTC in Coventry, uh, will be used to demonstrate automatic optical inspection. And it will incorporate a number of known defects on each of the boards, allowing us to compare golden boards and boards with known defects in, in specific locations. In addition, we'll also be using x-ray inspection uh, to again look at known defects created on these boards. And software will be considered uh, to join together the information provided by the machines uh, to optimize a process. That's the main part of the experience at Productronica this year. <laughs> 
There are some other features, but we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation this afternoon. Now, the companies involved in the experience this year, I've uh, shown here with their logos, and each one of those companies are involved either from a technical point of view, an equipment or material process, process point of view or supporting the feature area and it's my pleasure to have MPL and Smart Group involved in organizing the feature and Global SMT magazine supporting it with technical content within the pages of the magazine. So let's start to talk about the process. Now without any assembly process today with reflow technology there are certain positions in a production line where you could use automated inspection. If we step back a few years, uh, nearly everybody did manual inspection at each stage in manufacture. And some of you may re remember uh, when we did the PPM project, looking at PPM yield and defects. Of course, that was done manually. It could have been done automatically. But at that time, the majority of companies used uh, their operator and engineering skill to inspect manually. There are basic three positions that would normally be considered uh, to involve a piece of extra equipment, and those may be after the printing operation. And generally speaking, we refer to that as SPI today, solder paste inspection, although some screen printers will certainly have 2D and some will have 3D inspection, but perhaps not have the same capability as a separate machine. The next step in the process might be after placement. Um, so some companies may decide to put automated inspection after this stage in the process, uh, considering that um, it's easier uh, to perhaps correct a product or perhaps correct a few components prior to the reflow operation. Generally speaking, I see in industry the next step as being the prime area, and that is after reflow soldering. To guarantee the product is to the standard, which has been derived, and then it can go on to its automated test. It's possible that uh, you might decide to do the solder joint inspection after double-sided assembly, so after you've completed the second stage of your build for a product. Again, it just depends on the company. It possibly depends uh, more, in some instances, on the budget available for your production facility. But the nice thing is, with automated processes now, we can move equipment around between production lines and between different positions, which is quite common in contract manufacturing, less so in OEM manufacture. So at this stage, what I'd like to do is uh, run our very first survey. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask a question, and you're going to answer that question, I hope. Um, so basically, the first uh, poll we're going to be running is where do you feel is the most important place to place an inspection? So we're going to run the survey, and what you'll be able to do is now take the survey and select which step you feel is the most appropriate. So we're going to take um, just a couple of uh, minutes to let this run and then we'll see how many people participate and I want to get at least over uh, 90% uh, responses to the survey. So please just take a couple of moments and click which button is appropriate to you. So we've just got a few more percent to go, so we're over 90% of those people attending. So please uh, take, take the opportunity of casting your vote uh, before we uh, conclude this short poll. Excellent. 
So the results of each of the polls that we run this afternoon during the webinar, uh, the results will be available to you for reference. Uh, we'll show you some past poll results when I was running this particular feature in the US uh, at the end of the webinar. But you'll have the European figures uh, here after the webinar. So basically, the printing process is fairly well understood and fairly well controlled in the manufacturing process today. We use a metal stencil, and that stencil will vary in thickness between four thousandths of an inch up to six thousandths of an inch. And that's generally the thicknesses you tend to see. They will probably uh, either be laser cut or electroformed, being the two manufacturing processes most commonly uh, used in manufacture today. And one point I would raise is that I personally believe it's very, very important to inspect stencils and s inspect the apertures when you're evaluating stencils or selecting a stencil manufacturer just for, to make sure the stencil is consistent. And it's one thing that quite a lot of people do not do. So I would aid you, urge you to look at the stencil and the quality of the aperture. Now, during the printing process, whether it be solder paste or conductive adhesive, uh, what we do is draw the material across the surface of the stencil uh, with a squeegee blade and then separate the board and the stencil from those two surfaces, leaving the solder paste or conductive material uh, on the surface of the pad. Because the surface area of the pad is larger than the area the material is making contact with in the aperture. So consequently, that force is pulling it out. If any material is left within the uh, aperture of the stencil, then perhaps it's a stencil issue. Uh, it's a design issue because the stencil wall surface area is larger than the pad we're printing onto, or perhaps the printing parameters are not set up correctly. Each one of those needs to be investigated. Now, in this example, with the photographs at the bottom of the slides, I just show you solder paste deposit still left in the apertures. Now, generally speaking, with design today, uh, most companies tend to round off apertures. They don't have to have square apertures or truly square. So there tends to be slight rounding off. The reason being the solder paste or conductive adhesive separates more cleanly and, of course, gets closer to 100 degrees. 100% deposit from the intended design of the stencil aperture. Now, if we're printing onto very, very small pads, as is starting to become the norm in our industry, then uh, again, the basic process is exactly the same. But one of the things, again, to look out for, particularly when you go down to 0201, 01005 and smaller, is that the aperture um, really wants to be uh, not larger than the pad size. Now, in this example here, I just show you what can happen if the pad size is significantly smaller. And what tends to happen here is the pad goes into the aperture of the stencil, and it will affect the volume of solder paste or conductive adhesive, which is present on the pad as it releases. And certainly, it will tend to give you poorer print definition. And this close-up just shows you that. So again, looking and actually doing some measurements on the printed circuit board. Don't always believe the pad is the size you've designed. It's, it generally will never be. So understand what impact the pad size can have on your printing process. And also, a lot of companies have considered some moving over to uh, resist-defined pads uh, because that can potentially uh, improve the printing process, particularly for very, very small parts. Now, just to show you as an example, a recent study that myself and uh, Richard Boyle uh, from the Smart Group Technical Committee have been conducting, we've been looking at the assembly of the smallest com chip component which is currently available, uh, referred to as the 03015. Um, so smaller than the 01005 uh, devices. And if you look at the slide here, on the right hand, left hand side, you can see that the actual pads have been quite over etched. Um, they've actually got a point 
rather than the flat surface we're actually printing onto. So in this particular case, it did give us some problems during the printing process. On the right-hand side, the micro section shows what you might expect with pads that have been correctly etched. And here you've got uh, copper pads with nickel over the top surface. Um, there is a slight um, chamfer edge to the pads, but again, this is normal uh, when going through the etching and plating process but certainly not as bad as you see on the left hand side. Now, although we refer to these components by their um, dimensions and normally, historically, we always talk about thousands of an inch rather than microns, but here you've just got a, an illustration of three different parts from three different suppliers. It's two resistors and one capacitor. And you can see here the capacitor is actually smaller, but they still fall within that uh, category that we were discussing earlier. Now, commonly, the printing problems associated with small parts is misalignment of the paste or stencil to the pad um, or just poor printing because of the surface of the board. And in this example, we can see misplacement, but also on the right-hand side, we can see some uh, measure of coining of the solder paste, where the solder paste particles are compressed between the stencil and the pad and this is probably due to paste being present on the stencil prior to the printing operation. So from a previous print, we've got some paste trapped underneath the stencil. And as the stencil comes down to the board, the particles are compressed onto the pad. And you get this, what some people refer to as a solder particle splat um, or coining or compression. Now. One of the other things we found in our uh, study is that we could actually have boards with pads that were missing. And stepping back to probably 2008 uh, or thereabouts, we also saw this problem with uh, the initial trials on 0201. Remember, we're talking about very, very small pads. So the actual surface area of copper in contact with the laminate is relatively small. So mechanically, they're not very robust. So even in the PCB fabrication stage, we can lose pads, either by pressure of jets during the etching process, if they're not connected to anything else, uh, but certainly mechanical handling can have an impact. And on the right-hand side, we see poor paste printing, but we can still see some coining of paste onto the surface of the pad. Uh, and on the second pad on the right-hand side, you can see just one uh, particle of paste. It's interesting, when you get down to this sort of size, uh, it's not volume of paste, it's number of balls per pad um, that you tend to see or you can tend to monitor if you look at it uh, close up. Now, again, we're all aware of the importance of cleaning stencils. And these are just a couple of examples of stencils that have been used but have not been cleaned. And if you have material trapped within the stencil um, and it's not cleaned effectively, or perhaps it's trapped in there after a few prints and you're not doing sufficient cleaning operations after the first print, then of course this is gonna affect on the volume and also it's going to allow uh, paste perhaps not with a flux vehicle protecting it. Um, so it reduces the amount of material on the surface of the pad. So consequently, during reflow in air, you get poorer results. So regular cleaning of the stencil and possibly offline cleaning as well, or using manual ultrasonic cleaning can improve uh, the cleaning performance of the stencil. Now damage to stencil is you know, pretty straightforward. But still, still, when I do audits of companies, I quite often see stencils that are damaged. These are what I would consider very severely damaged. But any damage to the stencil will impact the quality and consistency of the printing process. So it's good practice to have a backup stencil of any design that you're running uh, because it is easy for me or any engineer to damage it. So um, just consider having backup stencils. Now, printing defects, well, we've been trying to deal with these for many, many years, and here's our some relatively simple ones. So on top left, we've got scooping, and this is where solder paste is printed onto a pad, but the pad is larger than we can effectively print. And the reason being, with a metal blade, 
certainly far more obvious with a rubber blade, uh, with scooping solder paste out of the aperture, possibly due to the pressure we're applying or possibly just to the size. So wherever you've got larger apertures, you want, you want to break them up into segments. So break it up into two or four, and then that reduces the amount the stencil is going to sweep in uh, to the aperture. On the top right, um, what's happened here is this poor control of separation of the stencil from the surface of the printed circuit board. So we're getting a fairly decent print, uh, but we're leaving some in the aperture. And it's consistency of separation, I would suggest, uh, from the board surface. On the bottom left-hand side, uh, you can see the same sort of things on SOT 23s, um, where the paste is not separating from the stencil cleanly on one side. On the bottom right, you can see what we refer to as wet shorts or wet paste shorts. And these are small particles of paste which are being forced between the apertures underneath the stencil and then be, being deposited on the next board. So this might be slow printing, it might be too high a pressure, it might be the stencil is not in contact with the pad sufficiently. Uh, a number of reasons can cause this particular type of defect. It's important to have some sort of basic criteria for inspection. Um, in any company, you should know basically what is acceptable, what will give you reliable solder joints, because you don't want to unnecessarily wash off boards. So have some basic criteria. Now, some people say, well, why bother? Because I've got SPI. Well, you still need to have criteria in your mind to be able to set up the SPI to do the automation for you, rather than just accept what's actually in the program. So some basic criteria is useful. Now, these examples were taken originally from the standards we used when we were doing the PPM project with Smart Group uh, that I ran uh, for the DTI. Uh, there is now an IPC standard, but again, just wanted to show you, first of all, uh, some of the reference examples. We can all argue about whether it should be 90% coverage, 75% coverage, but have a standard and train staff to that standard and hopefully always exceed that standard. That's the key thing in process control. The same thing is true, obviously, on misalignment. And we tend to see misalignment uh, a little more today uh, with higher processing temperatures, particularly from side one to side two. If you process a board um, and you print it successfully, then you reflow it and then flip the board over to side two, quite often you can actually see misalignment. And this is to do with the heating process and changes in relative position of the pads. And although a printer can adjust and align the stencil to the board, if the board is expanded and contracted, the stencil can't change. If you know the degree of expansion and contraction in either X or Y of a board, then you can design your stencil and modify your stencil around that. But you need to know going in what is the expansion characteristics of a particular design. Now, as I said, there is a, an IPC standard, 7527, and this was introduced uh, a year or so ago, and it gives you basic guidelines on printing uh, and also defects and also some basic criteria. And this is useful to set up your printing process and also to use as your reference when you're doing automatic optical inspection. Now, just a couple of more uh, relatively simple defects of misalignment. And although we're talking about uh, 25 thou pitch and some SOT 23s and small chip parts, as the packages go smaller and smaller and smaller, as we've already said with the 0201, 01005 and smaller, then alignment, an error in the printed circuit board, because of that second reflow operation, can have an impact. So again, think about and measure and find out what sort of variation you actually see. If you have boards from multiple suppliers, the laminate material may be different, so consequently, you might have problems uh, of alignment. Not significant problems, but it will all contribute possibly to uh, 
poor yields in manufacture. So this is a, a, a very old example of mine uh, when we were doing 0201 assembly at Productronica a few years back and myself and uh, Bruce Seaton, a good friend of mine uh, working with MPM, uh, noticed this phenomena when we went from side one to side two and we could see there was an error. Initially we just put it down to uh, printer setup but we could see the difference between side one and side two on our test boards. Now I mentioned about um, IPC standards as you're probably aware there's a standard for solder paste, there's a standard for stencil design, there's obviously standards for solder paste materials and of course the soldering standards themselves and IPC have kindly provided a set of standards uh, for us to provide for best question at Productronica. So if you come to the show with a, a particular process problem, uh, a defective board, etc., to the uh, MPL defect database live, another part of our feature area, um, best questions uh, get uh, a set of standards to take away uh, to, to return uh, to the factory if you haven't already got these documents. Now it's time for another survey or another poll and um, our second uh, poll that we are going to be running is on what do you feel contributes most to your printing problems? So what do you feel, what's the one thing that contributes in your opinion to uh, the problems you see uh, in your printing process? So I'm going to again give you a, a few moments to select which one uh, of the topics you feel most contributes uh, to your uh, problems. So if you just take a few moments, I want to run the poll until we get uh, just over 90% of you uh, selecting a particular topic. And as I said at uh, the end of this webinar, there are some results from when we ran these polls for the US market. But it's just nice to see uh, if the results that we get uh, this afternoon tie up with, in Europe, uh, what uh, engineers uh, across the US said. So we're just going to leave it for uh, another 20 seconds. We're very close to uh, over 90% respondents. So please just take a couple of moments. Just uh, click one of the uh, uh, topics that you feel uh, has the most impact on your yield. Okay, that's great. We've just got over the 90%. Now, at the uh, experience that we're running at Productronica, um, the same as I've done at other shows, uh, we have members of the MPL team, uh, myself and Chris Hunt, so I suppose that's, that's, that's members, there's more than one, um, answering questions. So if you've got any process problems, uh, any process defect boards, any uh, issues that you want to discuss, uh, we're there on the stand uh, for all four days of the show. Um, you can send any problems in advance uh, to my email address which when you get a copy of the presentation and download it, uh, you'll have that. And again, we'll take whatever time is necessary during the show to hopefully answer your questions. So free advice and free consultancy at Productronica uh, with the MPL Defect Database Live. Now with reflow soldering, um, we have lots of options today. And we've obviously seen the growth of vapor phase reflow uh, in the last... I guess sort of six years, seven years or so. Uh, originally vapor phase was one of the chosen processes right at the very start of SMT. It's certainly my process of choice at the very start of my career on reflow soldering as opposed to uh, infrared. Convection is the dominant process within our marketplace. You tend to find that uh, the majority of companies use convection in air and that tends to be what I see more than anything else. Um, and that's not saying that that's the best process, it's just saying that is a fact of life. Um, there are advantages with going to nitrogen, but again, an, a good engineer can select a board finish 
a solder paste material, even for ultra fine pitch and reliable and high reliability applications and run in an air environment. It doesn't have to use nitrogen. The benefits of vapor phase have been seen because of the movement to lead free technology and also uh, to do with the advantage of getting good reflow uh, with a low residue paste perhaps, a very small particle paste without the need of nitrogen in the convection process. And also with the introduction of modern vapor phase systems, the amount and the cost of the fluid uh, in the units has dropped dramatically. Well, I mean, the cost of the fluid remains the same, but the consumption rates have been dramatically reduced. So that's the advantage. So if you're an older engineer like myself, who've been through the days of vapor phase costing you a fortune to run, that's not the case today with good equipment and good operation. So what I show you here is just two um, thermoprofile graphs that I've picked uh, from my uh, library and we see convection we see vapor phase and we can adapt a profile for vapor phase to look like a convection profile if that's what you want to do in traditionally we would have difficulty in preheating and reflowing and having a nice steady profile uh, here we have a, nice, a relatively steady profile with small delta t's it is said sometimes uh, by some vapor phase salesman that you don't get any differential temperature across a printed circuit board and that's true when you get up to peak temperature where the material is condensing onto the surface so you can get a, a zero difference you will quite often monitor a difference because of the difference in calibration of thermocouple cables that you know that's a, a given um, but you will always get a differential in temperature it may be a lot smaller with vapor phase than it is con with convection and it may be also easy to run lead free and tin lead with one material in a vapor phase system. So if you were running 230 boiling uh, material, you could easily do tin lead and lead free. If you were doing tin copper, solar paste and uh, tin lead, then you might have to move up to 240 boiling temperature. However, with 240, you're still pretty close to a lot of companies profiles that they used to run with tin lead anyway if you are honest when you talk about the peak temperatures you actually see on your products now another conversation and whether this is important or not there's still lots of discussion on this is the use of uh, vacuum but vacuum does work there's no question that if you are if it's a critical application uh, you have to remove voids from solder joints then vacuum is something you can do um, and not change other process parameters like materials etc um, but normally speaking by enhancing the process that you're running you can reduce void formation and what I'm just illustrating here is how you can use vacuum vacuum when the solder is in a liquid state or theoretically we can bring in a vacuum right from the start of the reflow cycle and change the vacuum as we go through the process but the key thing with uh, this type of technology is making sure we do it slowly never pull a vacuum fast basically you're sucking air out of solder paste which is trapped underneath a component if you do you'll have a problem generally speaking when you look at um, uh, void formation it's the volatile material in the solder paste you're seeing these two video clips that I'm showing uh, online at the moment one shows the reflow of a QFP a QFN sorry and uh, the second one shows a sideways view of the QFN and when it gets to reflow what you'll actually see is the volatile material which is basically the, the liquid, the gelling agents of the solder paste visible. And we can see a certain amount of component float or movement. So there's a lot of volatile material present. And really, that's what you're trying to remove, which is present within the bulk of the solder. If you can reduce the amount of volatile material uh, from uh, the solder paste by going to uh, lower residues, that's good. But you mustn't affect the quality of the process by doing that but using vacuum does 
give you the ability to reduce void formation. So here's a couple of examples that I've included in this presentation. First of all, this is a, an example of a large uh, transistor package sitting on the solder paste prior to reflow. So you can see the solder paste, you can see the package, and this is not untypical with the challenges that many of us as engineers have to face. The next two examples show reflow in convection and reflow in vapor phase. And arguably, there's not a lot of difference between them. You can see a fair amount of voiding present underneath both packages. But when you use vacuum and use vacuum effectively, what we can do is virtually eliminate the voids, as you see in this fourth example on the bottom right of your screen. So you can see the paste printed. We've broken up the sections, broken up the print area, which is good practice to allow volatile material to escape and good printing, but we've still got voids. Yes, we could optimize the process to reduce the voids to some extent, but at some point you're going to get to the limit of what you can do and the limit you can achieve with a brand of solder paste. Yes, you could change and go to somebody else's paste, which may give you a marginal improvement, but using the vacuum, will certainly give you more flexibility in manufacture to reduce void formation. Now, the other reason that we see voids, and please consider this when you're looking at uh, solving problems, is that the actual materials that you're soldering to themselves. Uh, on the top left, I'm showing you a video clip which shows outgassing from the surface, the plating, as I simulate the soldering operation. You can see the gassing visible on the surface of the plating. This is a, a pin on a connector, and this generated hundreds of thousands of small micro voids. Uh, this example top right, you're seeing reflow soldering of an electrolytic capacitor, and you can see the plating gassing on the surface of the termination. Now remember, there's no solder paste here at all. This is just the termination. So don't always believe it's the solder paste and the profile which is the issue, also look at the component. If you look at this example, again, bottom right, I'm just showing me tinning a component termination, and look how it de-wets very, very quickly. Now, that action in its own right will cause quite large voids uh, during the soldering process. And quite a lot of you may well have seen this, an old video clip of mine, again showing soldering to a capacitor where we're successfully soldering and it will be a good join, but you can just out make out the bubbling on the surface of the plating. So again, in each of these cases, something on the surface of the plating, probably organics in the plating uh, process, which has contaminated the surface of the terminations, will lead to voids in solder joints. And our first assumption is that it's related to the process or the materials not necessarily the components. So always look further, look what's actually causing the problem. Now in this example, we've got some open solder joints on BMCs or bottom mounted components, uh, what some people refer to as QFN, LGA type packages. And we can actually get the same sort of phenomena of gassing, but not gassing physically from the surface, but it's gassing because of trapped volatiles. And on this type of component, it's quite common to have uh, solder resist define the pads on the package itself. So you've basically got uh, a resist uh, window and a termination you're soldering to. And as during the reflow process, volatile materials tend to climb within the solder joint and come up to the pad surface. If a solder joint hasn't formed at that point in time, and there's volatile materials against the surface where the solder is, it's just a gaseous layer which is preventing good soldering and good wettability, which could lead to an open solder joint. And it's something that certainly people processing these parts have experienced over the last few years. Now, squeeze out, solder squeeze out and compression, uh, again, is, in my opinion, tends to be more related to the assembly process prior to reflow. So what I've got here is some uh, examples of what some people call solder sausages, where you've literally got lumps of solder, not necessarily where you want them to be, to be between terminations. 
So a key thing when you're looking at any component which is a, a bottom mounted termination component, a QFN, LGA, is not to compress the solder paste during placement. Control the placement pressure, uh, make sure you're making contact, but you do not want to have displacement of the paste away from the pad area. Because during reflow soldering, what will happen? Well, there are the x-rays that shows you what can happen in this situation. So control of downstop is very, very important. Now, we're not talking about cleaning in the, the experience at Productronica, but selecting the right materials, solder paste materials, is also key. And I thought I'd include this uh, as a process defect. And what I'm showing you here is dendrites. And dendrites can be detected uh, using x-ray or CT uh, or optically. And these are one particular board that I was doing failure analysis on and I thought it would be neat to be able to show it with x-ray, which we did on the left-hand side, and on the right, uh, with the assistance of uh, Dave Bernard, uh, you can see the dendrites formation on my sample on the right-hand side. But the one in the center, basically, uh, from a failure analysis point of view, you want to do it as cheaply and cost-effectively as possible. So what I've done is I've ground up through the board, so I've literally ground like you would a microsection up through the board, just below the pads, the back of the pads on the laminate surface, and I can optically see the dendrite formation. And that's nice uh, because, again, it's a more cost-effective piece of failure analysis that uh, other engineers could do in their own facility. Now, solder wicking as a defect um, can be related to poor solderability of a surface. Um, and what you're looking at here is three examples of where the pad has not soldered or the solder has gone away from the pad surface. In these particular situations, it can be the process, i.e. one surface solders quicker than the other, and the wettability, solderability of the opposite surface won't wet within the time the solder is in a liquid state. If you think about this logically, you know, it's pretty obvious. But what in the process can we do to affect the wettability or solderability of the pad? Well, in the second example, in the middle of your screen, you're looking at a copper OSP board which went through a cleaning operation for side one assembly. And then when people went to side two, they had a problem not of printing, but of reflow. The solder paste reflowed beautifully, but it all went up the pin. And that's an example of wicking. And on the third example, on the right-hand side, you can see a similar phenomena where the solder paste is just reflowed and bored on the pad surface. And the reason for this was um, wash-offs. Washing off a board, but engineers not looking at the compatibility of the board finish and the wash-off process being used. So key thing is that you want to minimize wash-offs wherever possible by setting good solder paste printing criteria. But if you have to do it, make sure you do it properly and make sure you don't affect solderability or wettability. Solder wicking can also happen uh, and we can take a great volume of solder away from the pad surface, which is not a good thing to do uh, because obviously the amount of solder will affect the reliability of the interconnection. But these examples here can show the effect of how solder can wick away from a surface because there's better wetting on one surface than another. So as an example, if you're running a tin lead or lead-free process through convection, uh, but with um, nitrogen, you'll get better wetting. So let's say the pin solders quicker than the pad, then the solder is, n is inevitably going to wick up the pin. So it's taking volume of solder away from the pad. If that happens really, really quickly because of your very, very pure environment, then again, you could have an open solder joint because of it. With vapor phase, if you don't balance the preheat and also the reflow, again, the solder paste can tend to wet to one surface uh, more than another. Now, this will normally happen on J-lead or gull wing terminations. It doesn't really affect other parts to the same degree because you've got a long pin taking the solder away from the joint interface, which is what you want. And theoretically, as you reduce the amount, the volume of solder, you reduce the long-term reliability of the printed circuit board uh, interconnection and joint. So understanding wicking, how it occurs, how you can affect it, 
I mean, a simple way, if we look at uh, convection uh, with uh, nitrogen, if you get this phenomena, put less nitrogen in. You're dirtying up the environment. The wetting will be slower. You overcome the problem. Perhaps not a technical solution, but a very effective solution. Now, wetting on any surface, um, we like to be able to see it as readily as we possibly can. And this is just a very simple little trick um, which aids inspection and possibly aids inspection if you haven't got the highest end of piece of equipment uh, for doing inspection. So optically, you can see how the solder has changed its shape on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, as I've highlighted, you can see the solder wetting to different degrees on what we refer to as a wetting indicator. So these are great uh, to be able to, uh, to monitor different materials, different processes, uh, different board finishes, but also as an indication that your process is in control. When you're mixing tin lead and lead free is something you should avoid. And generally speaking, it's not an issue today because you know most people are using you know lead free and lead free uh, BGAs. Um, there is great debate in the industry about uh, if you mix them together, you know, the solder joint reliability is not as good. And there's been mixed studies on this, both positive and negative. It just depends when you started and when you ended uh, in this conversation. Um, but these are examples of what we did see during the transition where BGA manufacturers converted lead free, but in some instances didn't tell us. So we were using tin lead technology. And you've got joints uh, looking similar to this. One on the left-hand side, which hasn't collapsed. So the lead-free ball has not got to a complete reflow temperature. We formed a joint, which possibly is completely reliable, but it just doesn't look right. And then on the right-hand side, the balls have not become liquid. The solder paste has reflowed wet to it. Um, there's been a slight uh, misalignment on the pad surface, but we've made joints, again, most quality engineers wouldn't accept it, but it'd be interesting to actually see if you put that through temperature cycling, how long it actually lasts. Okay, time for another uh, little poll. I want to make sure that uh, all the engineers out there are working, uh, not just sitting back listening to me. So the third poll is during reflow, what contributes, in your opinion, most to defects? What contributes most to your defects? on reflow soldering. So again, I'm going to leave, leave a little bit of time for you to uh, have a go. If you'd like to uh, select what you feel contributes most uh, to your reflow soldering defects. And again, I'm going to wait until we just got just over 90% uh, to get a fair proportion of those people participating this afternoon. And of course, uh, if you're in a group uh, in a conference room, which I know a few of you are, please don't argue about this too much. Make sure you get a response in. Uh, or perhaps if somebody's in control of the Mickey Mouse on your PC, then you'll be the first one to give your vote. So just give it a few more moments so we're over 90% of those attending this afternoon. Getting very close to 90%. Come on, guys, make your mind up. Okay. Right. So, moving on to a few more reflow soldering defects. Um, something that uh, back right at the start of lead free technology, uh, we saw uh, at the lead free experience that uh, we ran uh, with a smart group. Um, this is non-coalescence of solder paste, where you've got solder paste with spots or warts. Now, that's what I used to call it, spotting or warting. Um, when the, uh, the US started to get into lead-free technology um, and also trying to have straight ramp profiles with very small paste deposits, uh, they came up with the term graping. And I think graping is a good term. Um, so basically, what we're talking about is the solder paste material um, during the reflow cycle was actually being exhausted 
So the volatile plus the fluxing agents and gelling material was being exhausted were left with the solder and there wasn't sufficient material to protect the surface. Now, if you were running vapor phase or you're running in nitrogen, you wouldn't see this as a problem. But if you're running in air or very low nit or very high nitrogen, uh, you wouldn't, uh, you would still see this as a, an issue. And again, more recently, uh, with my trials on the ultra small chip components, we've seen this again when moving to uh, a type six paste powder. Um, if you can run type four or possibly type five particle size uh, for the very small packages, shouldn't be so much of an issue. But again, you need to evaluate the paste for that particular act application. Vapor phase convection shouldn't be an issue and in all honesty when I microsectioned this particular joint you see on the screen now it was a good joint but I and I'm sure a lot of other quality engineers wouldn't have accepted it because of the spotting, warping, warting or graping as uh, the term now most commonly used for this. Another example again early days of lead free technology with very small passive parts you can see this and what we're using here is a, a tin zinc bismuth uh, solder paste. Uh, you can use tin bismuth solder paste and that's become quite popular for low process or low temperature processing. Um, and certainly my experience with this material potentially, certainly with the tin zinc bismuth material, then nitrogen really is the way to go. Uh, the tin bismuth materials can be used in an air environment, but look at when you're looking at very small parts again that can be a little bit of a struggle as you see in this example now something that um, we have seen and still continue to see periodically uh, is secondary reflow and there are two forms of secondary reflow one where you have already reflowed a product and do side two and the temperature you're using causes the solder joints uh, to reflow again and because you might have flexure of the board or the pallet supporting the board, you might get some open joints. So that's sort of typical secondary reflow. Or your reflow soldering and then your wave soldering that product or selectively soldering that product and you don't control your top side board temperature. If the board warps, you get open solder joints. That's classic uh, secondary reflow. The other form of lead uh, secondary reflow is where you've got a mixture of lead free and tin lead or to be more uh, more accurate uh, if you've got component terminations which have got lead on them so typical tin lead uh, so 90% tin 10% lead if you solder those with lead free again you can make some perfectly good reliable joints but you have to bear in mind that the the solder interface that you've created between that mixture with the lead contamination in the joint and the same thing can happen with other alloys is the actual reflow temperature of that joint will be equal to or lower than the material you're actually using so with lead free the actual temperature that joint would reflow for the second time would be more like tin lead reflow temperature um, so liquid reflow of joints like this is uncommon today because hopefully we've exhausted all the tin lead components that are out there so people won't use those in a lead free environment um, but it certainly was something that experienced in the early days and I still see it occasionally uh, when particularly in high reliability applications where components have been stored for long periods of time so there's still a lot of legacy parts around and if you look very closely under SEM scanning electron microscope or if you've got good eyesight uh, when you look at separation of pins and solder joints, uh, you won't see any brittle fracture. Now, brittle fracture of a solder joint is just like you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, the parts should link together again. If you've broken something apart, when you put it back together, uh, those fractures should align. Now, if you've got a liquid separation, which effectively we're looking at here, it's very smooth. So it's a way of determining what type of fault you've got and then that will indicate to you the reason for that particular failure mode. Now cracking of components again still happens uh, with BGAs and plastic packages. Fortunately with IPC controls you shouldn't have this particular problem but there are still times when 
uh, design engineers select components that are not compatible with the peak temperature of a normal process or components are bought inappropriately for a lead free process. There's no excuse for this. It's down to the designers to make sure that we specify the, rec the correct components for a particular process. To avoid doing second stage assembly, uh, which is something which should be avoided wherever possible, because it obviously has a major impact on the uh, cost of building a product. And subcontractors don't like it also. Here's an example of uh, cracking of BGAs. And here you can see I've pointed out with a couple of red arrows where moisture has expanded and actually escaped through the package, causing a crack line at the interface between the plastic and the fiberglass, or in the second example on the right-hand side, right through the plastic. Now, one of the nice things if you're using X-ray, you can see the degree of this, or you can actually see, perhaps not a failure, but you can actually see how package warps during the reflow process. Now, what I've done here is just taken a photograph or of a board that I've created uh, specifically to use on our X-ray machine at Productronica. And what we've got here is a nice example of warpage and if you look closely, I think most of you that are familiar with X-ray inspection will be able to see that uh, the balls are a different size. And if you look around the outside of the package, you can see the balls are a certain size. If you go and start to go into the center of the package, you can see the balls are slightly larger. And if you then were to measure that, you can actually see a trend. So what I'm just showing you now is... Uh, something that most x-ray machines will allow you to do, measure ball size. And it's a great process control uh, tool to see if there's any warpage on the packages. You can measure the corner heights, you can measure the center, li center lines and corner heights uh, using laser. But you know this is a nice technique to identify if you've got a problem with parts or potentially got a problem with parts uh, with uh, some degree of warpage. Now, solder joint failure can occur for a variety of different reasons, and I thought it's useful to show a few examples. Um, and this is a, a, an example whereby the manufacturer of the component didn't really get his plating right. So basically, a beautiful solder joint was produced. It passed through automatic optical inspection because it was a perfect solder joint. And if you look at the fracture line that I show you on this example, you can see there was a joint there. It went up the pin, round the pin, etc. so that's fine. But with a minimum amount of force, it broke. But it broke at the interface between the lead base material and the plating. So when you make a solder joint, you ideally are trying to form an intermetallic between the pin plated material and uh, the solder. But if the solder or plating interface separates from the pin, you're going to have a very weak and unreliable joint. In this particular case, the manufacturer did not use the correct pre-plating material over the base material of the pin. That was the mistake. Typically, you'll always have a barrier layer of copper or nickel on most pin surfaces to aid solderability and wettability and to improve reliability. And in the case of um, some forms of metal, it's there for other reasons as well. Now, cracking uh, on BGAs, what we refer to as pad cratering, is something that the industry still does suffer from. And unfortunately, sometimes we just don't know because you can have an intermittent joint um, which uh, would pass every test and potentially then fail at some point. But basically, separation of the pad, the copper pad, from the laminate surface uh, has been seen with certain materials, certain laminate materials, which have a lower peel strength or do not or cannot stand up to uh, mechanical force applied to them. So during heating and cooling of big boards with big BGAs on, we're actually putting a lot of stress on the weakest point, which is the pad to laminate interface. Now, I've shown a few photographs here of pad cratering, and there's, there's a whole mess of reasons why this can happen. Um, but using dye and pry is a perfect way, very inexpensively, uh, to assess, assess BGA solder joints in this particular failure mode. So I've just shown you a couple of examples. Top left is what you would expect to see after dye and pry. Uh, 
where we've ripped the pad off the board, but there is no evidence of the dye present underneath the pad. That was a good interconnection prior to me damaging it. And on the right hand side, you can see complete coverage of the glass bundles, strands underneath the pad with the dye. So clearly there was a gap there prior uh, to uh, us doing the testing. Hence it shows up where the fault actually is. So dye and pry testing is an old technique. It's been around for a long time. And I always encourage engineers to try it themselves because it's not difficult to do. Um, it's fairly inexpensive to do. Um, it takes time, yes. Uh, of course, you can employ people to do it for you. That's not a problem also. But I encourage you to try it because it is a great technique that you can use on lots of solder joint analysis. You can also use it for hip hop failures. Um, I'm not into hip hop music really because um, I can't understand most of the lyrics. If they say it slowly, I quite happily understand it. Anyway, back to soldering. So where we've got um, solder which is not wet with the solder which is on the pad or the ball, uh, we refer to this as hip hop. Now hip um, and hop, we're basically talking about the shapes of the joints uh, that we actually see after the reflow soldering operation. So these examples just come from uh, uh, my library of defects. Now you can see the same sort of things with high-end x-ray machines and certainly CT if you have that capability. Uh, and these examples basically what I've done is moved the uh, sample around within the x-ray chamber and you can actually see um, the shape change. Now, if you just look straight down through the x-ray, straight down through the ball onto the pad, quite often you can't see it. But if you're able to orientate the board or the head, you can see it if you take a bit of time. And certainly, obviously, this is more non-destructive than my die and pry I mentioned earlier. So with hip-hop, it can be related to warpage of the board, warpage of the package, so what I'm showing you here is a couple of examples um, where we've got exactly the same type of defects on the first example, top image. On the bottom example, I'm showing you uh, a package on package, and this is the newer generation, the TMV package, where we're actually soldering ball on top of ball. And you can see here that I've got two that I've soldered fairly effectively, and the last three are open. And this is because the package hasn't set, settled down uh, quick enough and the fluxing material, the flux is being applied to those two surfaces hasn't got sufficient energy to allow it to clean those surfaces to allow reflow to take place successfully. So that's a sort of classic example of what you might expect to see on this type of package. These uh, views now I show you, again I'm pointing out the depression uh, in the solder sphere and then on the right hand side of that image you can actually see the flux material physically on the ball, um, but again, no evidence that the two have reflowed together uh, with the adjacent ball. So again, uh, package on package technology, some of you may be aware I wrote a book on the, on the subject, um, is again being used in a lot of applications, particularly wearable technology in some of the new uh, smartwatches. Again, it's been used in the telephone industry for quite some years. If we look at solder joint failures, I thought it was useful to show a couple of different types. Um, and what we've got is a reflow failure. And what you're looking at here is a solder joint. and The pin is broken out of the solder. And this is very, very similar to one that was sent into the MPL defect database uh, only a couple of weeks ago. And I apologize to the engineer. I was on holiday, so I didn't respond quite as quickly as I would have normally have done. But it's exactly the same. It's, we've got a reflow solder joint. And what has probably happened most, most commonly with this type of failure, when it visually looks like this, it's a problem with the plating on the component. So it's not actually the solder joint per se, which is the problem, or the solder paste or the profile. So look at the component uh, surface. That's probably what the root cause was. I know it was in this particular case, but it may well be on the example that I was shown. Now, when we're looking at uh, reflow or intrusive reflow or re secondary reflow on uh, copper finishes, um, this is a good example where we had a good solder joint. It was reflowed again, and all the solder literally wet up the pin and away from the joint area. Um, so it actually de-wetted. Now, de-wetting of terminations is fairly uncommon. 
it can happen but it's fairly uncommon so taking all the solder away from the interconnection would obviously reduce the strength and the reliability of the joint in this couple of examples this is a, a, an example of solder joint failure um, but really it's a design fault um, what has happened here is you've got expansion and contraction between the pin and the PCB and however much solder you add to the joint it will last longer but still it's going to fail and in the bottom example where you can see the solder crack on a single sided board again the same sort of phenomena the hole to lead ratio is very large you could get two pins in that hole um, and when you get that and you're wave soldering or selective soldering or even hand soldering you tend to get a much smaller fillet because the solder is literally bridging the gap between the pad and the pin if you add more solder to it it will be stronger but it will still fail ultimately if you've got the temperature cycling forming uh, large differences between the PCB and uh, the pin uh, during operation of the product here we've got a mechanical fault which then relates and causes uh, failure of the product so basically we've got a solder joint but this was on a very very heavy component and basically what was happening is uh, the product or the board assembly was uh, vibrating and in time it actually caused the solder joint to separate and then at some point you've got arcing electrical arcing which actually caused the joint plus the board uh, to start to overheat and then burn now if we look at the component termination and look at the pin and then looking at the application we should have been able to figure this out what the root cause of the problem was but it's looking at each surface everybody well a lot of people tend to concentrate on one surface but always look at both surfaces that gives you a good indication of the potential failure mode in this example this is a classic example of mismatch and most engineers will have learned this uh, in the early days of SMT uh, where you've got a large differential expansion between a ceramic component and the PCB uh, what will happen is in time the solder joint will fail so you've got some classic examples uh, of cracking of LCC terminations and down the bottom again the solder joint but in this particular case you can actually get this type of failure mode uh, due to vibration and vibration can actually cause this type of separation but it tends to look different um, during the lead up to failure so if you compare temperature cycling to vibration or mechanical shock you will see a difference in the formation of the solder joints now these examples are due to conformal coating again uh, what's happened here is you've got beautiful solder joints but conformal coating was applied by dip coating and the material filled completely the underside of uh, very thin uh, T-salt packages and then during temperature cycling the material expanded and contracted expanded and contracted and that was the root cause of the separation of the solder joints which you can see uh, under x-ray inspection this was actually an example brought to us uh, on a previous MPL defect database live uh, at Apex uh, in the US now possibly by selecting a better combination of conformal coating and this particular package you could have improved the results but on some occasions with certain components uh, any material uh, that you place underneath a package can cause sufficient energy uh, to be exerted during temperature cycling or sufficient expansion and contraction greater than the package and the lead based material uh, and this can occur so again good evaluation of your operation is important again a close-up and you can actually see how the solder has separated from the pad surface now some things which don't necessarily cause failures but are we see them with lead free technology uh, the first one I've already mentioned which is secondary reflow where your pin is separated from the solder and the trick here is always look at the interfaces between the pin and the solder and you can tell if it's a liquid separation or mechanical separation because you've got brittle fracture so pulling the surface apart look at them under high magnification you can normally tell second example is uh, where we're getting uh, cracks 
or dare I say, perhaps more appropriately, tears in the surface of the solder. Uh, the solder manufacturers don't like the term cracks, but it's really a tear. And uh, what you will have with tin, silver, copper alloy joints, and you can have this with selective soldering, uh, 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 pin and paste soldering, or wave soldering, is in the surface, as the solder solidifies, uh, you can get these tears in the line. It tends to happen more with the higher silver content tin, silver, copper materials, and it's covered under IPC. Also, uh, pad lifting and fillet lifting. In the bottom example, this SEM is fillet lifting, uh, which can happen after selective wave soldering or intrusive reflow. And again, it's the solder has cooled, the board is still contracting back and leaving the solder slightly lifted from the surface. Again, there is criteria within IPC 610 for this on lead-free joints, not on tin lead, but on lead-free joints. Okay, final, final poll uh, for today is uh, on process. And what I wanted to ask you is what assembly process contributes most to, or most to your defects? Which of the assembly processes listed here contributes most uh, to your assembly issues? So we'll just take a, a few moments uh, to uh, get all of, the, uh, all of you to respond to this. So again, I'm just going to give it a bit of time. So we're over 90%. So if you just like to select the process which you feel contributes most to your general assembly problems. So there's two reasons why I like to do these surveys. First, it gives some information back to yourselves, what other engineers think within the industry. And it also makes sure that uh, if you're not in a group, in a conference room, if you're an individual engineer listening to the webinar, you haven't fallen asleep. Um, so there's two reasons for me doing this. Uh, and hopefully you find the information derived from uh, uh, feeding back from multiple engineers in different companies or different parts of the world uh, to be useful. So we're just coming up to uh, over 90%, and then I'll uh, conclude this uh, poll. Come on, just two or three more people. Make your selection. There you go. Excellent. Okay, so what I've tried to do um, is talk about different defects uh, different processes. We've talked about um, some of the basic process parameters and things that we can do. Um, briefly wanted to mention the uh, defect database and all the reports we have. At MPL we've put together all of our reports, you know, going back many years and then bang up to date on our database. And there's over 150 different reports covering all aspects of electronic manufacture, environmental testing, high temperature alloys, conformal coating, tin whiskers, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you can download any of these reports free of charge by literally just going to the defect database. Uh, and when you get a copy of the slides, you'll be able to take uh, the URL, which is in the bottom of the slide. Uh, and these reports are free of charge. Um, but again, they're based on a lot of hard work by the EI division uh, within NPL. Now, the other thing that we've done at, uh, with the defect database is provided not only reports, but also a reference source. And before I show you some examples of that, this is the responses on a couple of the surveys which I conducted for the US market, and you've already contributed to. So what location is preferred for automatic inspection? So for the US market, 98% uh, uh, of engineers uh, said that reflow soldering, after reflow, was the one place or the place that predominantly they wanted to use their automatic inspection. Now, what do you feel contributes most to your printing problems? Now, the US engineers here said that stencil design and the condition of the stencil contributed most to their problems. And then it was printer setup and the PCBs, and less so 
uh, solder paste. And it'll be interesting to see the results and compare them with US engineers as opposed to uh, us in Europe. And what assembly process contributes most to your defects? And in the US marketplace, uh, printing was put down to 60%. And as you can see here, most of the others, fairly low numbers. Uh, reflow was next, placement, and then uh, selective and hand and rework. So printing was predominantly the process that they felt contributed most to their defects. So back to the defect database live. Um, this is the database website that you can access at any time, 24-7. Uh, and it allows you to select the process you're interested in, the alloy, the defect type, uh, the product, product classification, etc. And all you need to do is make a selection or a number of selections, and it will present you with uh, lots of pretty pictures. And you then say, OK, this particular picture looks like the problem I've got. And you click on that, and it will take you to the next screen. So here you see details, description about the boards, the problem, the process that was being used, a photograph, which is the one you've already selected, and also recommendation on the possible causes and corrective action. So that's the Defect Database Live. And if there is any examples that are not included when you look through, there's you know a couple of hundred different types of defects on there. But if there's something that's not included and you have a problem with it, then send us a picture. Contribute to the Defect Database Live because it will make it better for future engineers. You can click on the picture and make it full screen if you wish. And you can print this out with the other information uh, to pass on to colleagues or pass on to uh, other engineers in your facility. So it's the first time something like this has been created, and it's only as good as the material added to it. And the more people add to it, the better it will become and be useful or even more useful for engineers in the future. So once again, a reminder that what we're doing at Productronica, and this is a pre-webinar of the Productronica feature, and we're running a solder paste and solder joint inspection experience which is involving solder paste, conductive adhesive. We're doing automatic inspection of those boards uh, for volume and height and quality. And then what we're doing is taking boards that we've already pre-soldered and I've created specific defects on, plus golden boards, to examine using AOI, or we're using X-ray inspection for area ray packages, again with specific defects on. Again to allow you to see those defects, how they can be detected, but more importantly, how the information gathered from the different machines can be brought together and further analysis be conducted on those uh, sample boards. So hopefully you'll join us at Productronica. It really is one of the best shows in the world to attend, and hopefully uh, you'll join us on at Hall A4, stand 506, for uh, the experience. Just a reminder that uh, the webinar slides uh, will be sent to you in uh, a link, and this is the information on this particular screen. However, will be sent to you uh, by email, and also the recording of this particular webinar will be available uh, on my YouTube uh, uh, website uh, probably a couple of hours after the end of this webinar. So what I'd like to do is uh, thank you very much for attending the webinar this afternoon. Again, if you've got any problems, uh, problem boards, questions, etc., then please, you can either email them uh, or just come along to uh, the uh, feature area at Productronica and we'll do our best to answer any questions about any process. It doesn't have to be just screen printing and, and solder paste and uh, a conductive adhesive or a solder joint inspection. It can be pretty much anything, but the focus of the area is all about those two things, solder paste, conductive adhesive printing, inspection, and of course, solder joint inspection as well. You'll be able to meet up with uh, myself, Chris Hunt uh, from MPL. You'll be able to uh, meet up with some of the smart group team, and of course, all of our partners in this year's uh, experience. So once again, thank you very much for participating in this webinar, and good afternoon to you all.